In this lecture, we're looking at Luther on the third use of the law. Now, this is one of those lectures that students often misunderstand based on the title. Or when they come to it, they wonder just what we're talking about here. Because it would seem, at face value, that either these issues of the law or more modern concepts, more modern debates, over covenantal theology versus dispensational theology. That's misstep one. The other is a fundamental confusion that happens amongst sort of popular level understandings of the Reformation when it comes to the role of the law in the Christian life. It wouldn't take you very much, in fact, it would just take a Google search, for you to find all kinds of evangelicals, even in the last couple of years, over the subject of the law and the Christian life. Repeatedly, you have one group that accuses one side of being antinomian. That is to say, they accuse the other side of being anti-law. And these tend to be the folks that are concerned about loose living and people that have cheap grace. And they look on one side and people that are preaching this radical gospel of justification in a more Lutheran vein, though often beyond what Luther ever would have said. These folks on this side tend to look on the other side and say, you are opposed to the law. Well, from the other side, you often hear claims that these people who talk about law and obedience and these kinds of things are just a bunch of Pharisees. And you get a lot of here I stand speeches and usually a lot of weirdo stuff about how the Lutheran Reformation came to stop us from any of this conversation about obedience. Well, what's going on here? Believe it or not, this type of debate and it happens across denominations, and it happens all the time, frankly. And it's only really increasing now that the Internet age has made it easier to communicate with people. These types of squabbles really have become easier to spot, and people never cease to get in fights about this. Well, what's at stake here? What is the issue? Well, the issue is, too often what happens is people are unaware of the categories that are at stake, or the categories that are in play, when we're talking about the issues of the law and the Reformation and its understanding of justification. Here's the thing. There are classically three uses of the law. Now, I'm going to go ahead and head you off in the past here. These three issues of the law are not ceremonial, moral, etc. When we're talking about the three uses of the law in the context of the Reformation, we're not talking about the relationship of the Old Testament law to the New Testament abrogation or continuation of the legal code of Israel. That question, again, is dealing with dispensational versus covenantal or alternative strategies for understanding the relationship of the Old Testament and the New Testament. That is a debate that is about 150 years old, and it's not the one that's in play here. We're talking now about the use of the law before and after salvation. Again, classically, there are three uses of the law, and we're going to go through these pretty quickly, and then we're going to get to what Luther has to say about the third use. Okay, so there are three, and they are civil, salvific, and obedience uses of the law. Now, right off the bat, we have to note, frequently what happens is people believe that when we're talking about the law and obedience in the Christian life, we're only talking about one or two uses of of the law. So students always sort of pause and they say, wait, there's three. Well, the odd man out for most modern Christians is the first use of the law. Though there is a way to understand this that I think will make a great deal of sense, even in the 21st century. The first use of the law is the civil use. Now, by civil use, the reformers meant the use of the law almost entirely apart from the issue of salvation. This is the way the law would be used in the context of government. This is kings and queens ruling against right and wrong, ordering the society, providing governance and structures, etc. Now, this first use is vital because, again, it has nothing to do with salvation. And in many places where you see, for example, control being exerted on a populace, either during the Reformation or not long after, What's in play here when they're saying we're going to apply God's law to our society and we're going to make sure that God's law is lived out in the public Christian life? Again, there's not a salvific motif in play here. The civil use of the law 
again, is the public use apart from any relationship to the cross or salvation. It's not a theocracy. It's not people trying to force Christianity down people's throats. Again, this is still the world of Christendom. But rather, this is the use of God's law in the public domain. Now, again, most people go, I'm not sure about this. Let me give you just two quick examples as to how most people do actually apply this first civil use of the law today. First and foremost, there are occasionally debates whenever a judge or someone in the legislature wants to put the Ten Commandments up on a wall. A certain number of Christians always scratch their head about this. Why would a judge who's enacting and applying the American legal code really want to say that God's law, which is used to drive us to Christ, is the foundation of that American legal code? Even if you set aside the idea of America as a Christian nation, or even if you embrace it, frankly, that's irrelevant. Most people go, well, hold on. The law is there to point us to Christ, so why should it be in a courtroom? Well, by and large, most people, we can't speak for everybody, but most people who are in favor of this kind of thing do so because they believe that God's law is some kind of natural best practices, you might say, as to how to govern and lead with wisdom. Okay, that's one. The second one you're all going to get, and this makes, I think, a great deal of sense, and I call this the Chick-fil-A rule. If you were to get out of church on Sunday and you were to go driving around and you were to suddenly find yourself hungry and you decided you want a chicken sandwich more than anything else in the world, and if you were to then go to Chick-fil-A and pull in and drive up to the drive through you would immediately begin to weep because Chick-fil-A would be closed. Now, if you were to sort of get into Chick-fil-A culture and if you were to find out why they close on Sunday, the fundamental root of it is because they believe that God's law tells us to keep the Sabbath holy. So they close on Sunday, and they give their employees the Sabbath off. Now question, do the owners and the managers of Chick-fil-A restaurants believe that they're saving the souls of their employees because they give them Sunday off? Do they believe that by giving them Sunday off, that they're somehow pointing them to Christ fundamentally? Well, maybe, but that's not the reason why they do it. Rather, they do it because they say, God's law says, keep one day holy, and we're going to do this as a culture within our organization. Put simply, that is the essence of the civil use of the law. It's not pointing people to Christ. It's not attempting, at the core at least, to address really much of anything when it comes to salvation. And that's why, in this sense, the civil use of the law is called the bridle. It's the thing that restrains us from our excess. It stops us in our tracks whenever we want to do too much or do too little when it comes to a civil society. It addresses, though perhaps not as clearly as people want it to, issues of capital punishment, rest, recuperation, and all kinds of other things. So that's the civil use. Okay, here's the thing. Every reformer embraces the civil use of the law. None of them, not one, has much to say that would challenge or shade this view of the civil use of the law one way or the other. So we can strike that off. They're both in agreement, Calvin and Luther, on the first use of the law. What about the second use? Well, the second use is the salvific use. The second use of the law is where the law points us to our inadequacy. It's this use of the law that Paul is referring to again and again in Romans. The law came and it showed us our sin. It showed us how impossible it was to live up to the standard of our own self-righteousness. This use of the law, in other words, is the core gospel message. You're a jerk and a sinner and you need Jesus. Left to yourself, you have no capacity to achieve anything close to the righteousness that the covenant demands. In this sense, the second use of the law, as it's called, is more like a mirror. A mirror shows you who you really are. Let's just be blunt. No one blames the mirror when you're ugly. <laughs> if you're ugly, you walk to the mirror and you go, ooh. Well, again, the mirror is not doing that. It's just showing you exactly who you are. Well, run that through a spiritual analogy. When the law comes, it is a mirror. It says, are you perfect like this? And we say, no, I'm not. And the law says, well, then you deserve death. 
And that use, the second use, drives us to Christ. Now, here's the thing. Calvin and Luther, on the same page with the second use of the law. Now, there's one little wrinkle here I want to add, which is that, unfortunately, the Reformed tradition, and Calvin himself on some level, have a bit of an annoying habit where they will actually flip one and two in this order. So in the Reformed tradition, very often, the first use of the law is the salvific, and the second use is the civil. And it's really tomato-tomato. The Reformed tradition does this because they say, well, the law really is there primarily for the salvific, so let's go ahead and put it up there at number one. But nonetheless, this is just the issue of how we number them. It's not as if this numbering comes from the scriptures itself. Okay, so we've gone through two uses of the law, and now here we are to the third use. The third use is, as I've loosely called it here, the use for obedience. The analogy that's often used here, we should start with, and that is the obedience use, using the law as a tool for the Christian life, is like a flashlight. In this case, the law shines a lamp onto the path in front of us. This use, in other words, comes as a result of salvation. Once the sting of the law is gone, once we no longer fear condemnation or judgment, suddenly we sit back and say, now that I am a child of the king, well, this law here is something beautiful. I can approach it as my father's law. I can approach it as a good thing. Now that I'm wrapped in the righteousness of Christ, the law no longer terrifies me. Well, here's the thing. This third use, this is the key one. Because on this, Luther and Calvin disagree. And this lecture is about Luther, so we're going to focus here. Luther is entirely opposed, not necessarily in name, because these categories were not quite formed by the time Luther died in 1546. But Luther, the brunt of his theology, says that the law never ceases to be a terror to us. Now remember, again, just as we looked at with Luther on justification, back and forth, back and forth, the Lutheran model of preaching and of the Christian life is that we apply law and gospel repeatedly. That is to say, in Luther's theology, the very core of it is that the law, when it comes, always terrifies. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. The law will always come and hold up a mirror and say, you are imperfect. And every time we hear that, Luther says, no matter how much we hide it, no matter how much we think we've gotten beyond it, the sting is still there. Therefore, the second use of the law for Luther is the biggest use, and it is the only way to use the law. Trying to use the law as a flashlight, as a guide for the Christian life. Saying, well, now that I'm justified, now that I'm a Christian, I can now approach the law as a positive thing. Luther says that is impossible. Now, Luther doesn't say it's impossible because the law is evil or that it's bad. Rather, Luther is, you might say, existential on this point. He's just flat out blunt. He says our psyches cannot handle the law without feeling its sting. It's impossible, he says. And so, again, while Luther doesn't have a work or a paragraph or any specific verbiage about the, quote, third use, Lutherans shortly after his death and all the way down to the modern world, affirm to their very core that the third use of the law is impossible. And that actually those who try to apply the law to the Christian life after they're saved, after they've had a conversion, are just kidding themselves. It's impossible, they say. You can't live up to this. It always is going to sting you. Now, what does that mean practically? Well, it means that in the Lutheran homiletical tradition, you're not going to have law, gospel, and then a third point of, now therefore go and do blank. Or, okay, here's the gospel, and let me tell you how you ought to get on about X, Y, or Z in the Christian life. People who are Lutheran who take this very seriously, this idea of the third use of the law, get very sniffy at times, get very concerned about things like accountability groups or any language of obedience any language of sanctification, as we saw in our lectures on justification. For Luther, again, it's justification through law gospel. Any attempt to use God's law as a light or a lamp onto our feet 
as something that we can then use in a positive sense, fundamentally denies what the law is there to do. And, this is the more important thing in the practical sense, for Luther, what people end up doing is hiding and shrouding who they are through the very process of self-righteousness. On this point, Luther is at his best, frankly. He's at his most trenchant. Because he points out again and again and again, you don't have to be a monk living in a monastery to believe that you're living self-righteously. Rather, he says, you could be that nice, pious person who is on about the obedience of Christ and who talks incessantly about how they need to obey Christ. Luther will sort of fold his arms and look at you and say, or what? Are you telling me the law is somehow, after I have been justified, still hanging over my head? What's the or else here? If you're telling me I have to get on with obedience, it sounds to me like you're going back to the way things were. No, nope, for Luther, second use of the law is the only use in terms of the Christian life and in terms of the liturgy and the preaching. There is no use for Luther. There is no help. There is no practical wisdom. And in particular, there is no pastoral right to ever wag your finger and say, folks, we need to obey God's law here. We need to pay attention to the word. We have to do these things. Because, again, in a colloquial sense, Luther will just simply ask, or what? Because if you say, or else God will throw us out, you have again fallen backwards, imperceptibly perhaps, baby steps backwards, into Pelagianism yet again. And again, Luther is at his most trenchant. Some of his most brilliant comments are at the subtle duplicity where we attempt to use the law in a positive sense, and it ends up perverting the very thing we're attempting to do. Okay, that's it. In our next lecture, we're going to look at Calvin on this same issue. Did he agree with Luther on the third use of the law? Mm -hmm.